Starlight camera, for example, is the handiest flash camera. And a changer for standard 10 and 12 inch. This system has a number of advantages over hand methods. The 1950s introduced various tools and appliances that transformed daily life, from coal furnaces to ringer washing machines. Whether waiting for the milkman or dialing a rotary phone, these devices made everyday tasks more convenient. Join us as we look at 25 things from the 1950s once necessary, now completely obsolete. We're ready to add coal. Can you see that right there? Okay, see how hot that is? This charcoal is really looking good. Coal furnaces were the backbone of home heating in the 1950s. First gaining popularity in the late 1800s, these massive octopus furnaces spread warmth through spreading duct systems, keeping families toasty through cold winters. Coal became the top fuel source in 1885, replacing wood as the preferred way to heat American homes. These furnaces were special because they relied on natural convection, circulating heat without electricity or fans. Sure, they were bulky and labor-intensive, and you had to stoke the fire manually, but their reliability made them a must-have in colder regions. However, by the end of the decade, gas and oil furnaces offered easier, cleaner alternatives, and coal furnaces became a thing of the past. Have you ever wondered how your grandparents stayed entertained before Netflix? G3CFN? Hello, G3CFN? This is VS1DZ calling you. Are you receiving me? In the 1950s, vacuum tube radios were kings of the airwaves, bringing news, music, and drama into homes nationwide. First developed in the early 1900s by John Ambrose Fleming, these radios transformed communication by amplifying audio signals. By the 1920s, they had revolutionized radio broadcast, turning families into loyal listeners. So, what made vacuum tube radios so unforgettable? Their warm, rich sound quality created an enchanting listening experience that people cherished. Families gathered around the radio for evening shows, making it the central home entertainment hub. However, as technology advanced, transistor radios, which were smaller and more portable, began taking over by the 1960s, pushing vacuum tubes into retirement. What must it have been like rushing to an office to send a message? If you lived in the 50s, you would have known. In the 1950s, telegrams were still vital for sending urgent news. The idea dates back to the 1830s when Samuel Morse developed Morse code, revolutionizing long-distance communication. By the mid-20th century, telegrams had become the go-to option for sending life-changing messages across the globe from announcing weddings to delivering business contracts. So, what made telegrams so important? They carried an air of urgency and formality that phone calls or letters couldn't match. You had no better choice if you needed to get your message across fast. Telegrams slowly faded into history as the telephone and fax machines gained traction, leaving behind a rich legacy. So, what if you could have a full body workout by just doing laundry? Didn't have time to study the question. In fact, she didn't have time for much of anything except her job. She had heard that homemaking was the biggest job in the world. Maybe it was. People of the 1950s used ringer washing machines as household essentials for cleaning clothes. These machines, first developed in the 1840s, featured two rollers, the ringer, to squeeze out excess water after a wash. Electric versions made the process easier by the mid-20th century, but it was still far from today's push-button simplicity. GE's famous filter flow washing system cleans and re-cleans wash water, and lint is caught in the filter, not on These machines were great because they cut drying time and effort, which was invaluable in larger households. Families relied on them to handle massive laundry loads, making them a must-have gadget. However, as fully automatic washers became more affordable in the 60s, ringer washers were quickly phased out, ending an era of physically demanding laundry days. Woman's place was in the home. In fact, she was practically a prisoner in the home. Somebody was arguing about equal suffrage. Votes for women. Imagine waiting for the Iceman to deliver your daily supply like people of the Golden Age did. Long before refrigerators became standard, 
Ice delivery was a lifeline for households trying to keep their food fresh. Ice boxes, essentially insulated cabinets, became common in American homes. Ice companies, like those started by Frederick Tudor in the 1800s, delivered ice blocks to keep perishables from spoiling. This is our ice box. It was made in the early 1900s and we retrieved it from a barn in Norman, Oklahoma on a farm. Without ice deliveries, families couldn't store milk, meat, or produce for very long, which made them a necessity at that time. Regular visits from the ice delivery man were a part of daily life, particularly in the summer. However, as electric refrigerators spread through homes in the 1950s, ice boxes and the need for ice deliveries quickly melted into the past. How about getting fresh milk delivered to your doorstep every morning instead of buying it from a grocery store? And when the 551 people of San Abbas have got their milk, it's time for the Lord and Lady of the Manor to go back for a quiet cup of tea in the ancestral home. In the 1950s, milk delivery was as common as the daily newspaper. First gaining popularity in the late 19th century, milkmen delivered fresh milk in glass bottles directly to homes across the U.S. This practice first took hold in Vermont in 1785 and spread as urbanization increased, making it harder for people to keep their own cows. Glass bottles, introduced in 1878, helped keep milk fresher and more hygienic, which added the services appeal. Hundreds of covered trucks such as these, as required by milk board regulations, carrying thousands of cans, are constantly on the move over many hundreds of miles. What made milk delivery special was the convenience. Families didn't need to worry about running out, and the milkman's early morning visits meant there was always fresh milk before breakfast. But by the 1950s, refrigerators became common, and people could store their milk, gradually ending the era of the friendly neighborhood milkman. Now, let's zoom into when mowing the lawn was a full day and required all your efforts. That's how it's been done. You can see it there. If you have this manual grass cutting machine, you can actually just roll it over and you can clean uh, your lawn. Manual lawn mowers, particularly push-powered reel mowers, were essential for keeping lawns tidy in the 1950s. First patented by Edwin Beard Budding in 1830 in England, these mowers featured rotating blades powered entirely by human effort. They quickly became a popular tool in suburban America as post-World War II housing developments spread across the country. What made manual lawnmowers stand out was their simplicity and reliability. They were eco-friendly and easy to maintain without gas or electricity, making them a must-have for homeowners. As gasoline-powered mowers came into play in the mid-20th century, the demand for manual mowers dropped, but they remain nostalgic symbols of simpler times and quieter Saturday mornings. Now let's see the world in black and white like people in the 1950s did. You mean like, uh, who put the box? Sure. By <laughs> Thanks to pioneers like John Logie Baird and Philo Farnsworth, black and white television sets became commercially available in the late 1930s. By the 50s, these sets had gained massive popularity in American living rooms, becoming the centerpiece of family entertainment. While TV itself had existed in some form since the 1920s, it was only in post-World War II America that owning a set became common. What made them so essential was their role in shaping modern media. Families would gather around to watch news broadcasts, variety shows, and classic sitcoms, often together, making it a social event. Although color TV was introduced in the 1950s, black and white sets were much more affordable and thus remained a must-have until colored TV finally took over in the 1960s. While television was all black and white, what was taking pictures like in the 50s? At that time, people used film cameras with flash bulbs that offered you only one picture at a time. They were the go-to for indoor photography in the 1950s. General Electric launched the first successful commercial flash bulb in 1927, revolutionizing photography. These single-use bulbs provided instant lighting, making it possible to capture moments in low-light settings that would have been impossible otherwise. Starmite camera, for example, is the handiest flash camera Kodak ever made. 
and it lets you get good pictures the first time with no instruction at all. <laughs> While it might not seem so, flashbulbs were easy to use and brought photography indoors, allowing families to capture more memories regardless of lighting conditions. Photographers no longer needed large, heavy equipment to get that perfect shot at night or indoors. But by the 1970s, built-in electronic flashes and digital cameras replaced these early innovations, leaving flashbulbs as a nostalgic part of photography's history. How could we miss the best part of the 1950s when dialing someone's phone number was different? That tone indicates everything is ready for your call. With the receiver off the hook, dial the desired number. Rotary dial phones were the standard for making calls throughout the 50s, and their history dates back to the 1890s when Almond Stroger invented the first dial system. By the mid-20th century, these phones were everywhere in the U.S., helping people connect without needing an operator to place their calls. They were important because they allowed people to dial numbers directly, making communication faster and more private. The iconic click-click-click sound as the dial rotated back was a familiar part of daily life. However, by the 1960s, push-button phones entered the scene, offering quicker dialing, and the era of rotary telephones began to fade. People of the 50s surely recall that satisfying cha-ching after a purchase. Next, we'll discuss mechanical cash registers. Mechanical cash registers were once the lifeblood of retail, introduced in 1879 by James Riddy, a saloon owner in Ohio. Known as Riddy's Incorruptible Cashier, these machines helped business owners track sales and reduce employee theft. By the 1950s, cash registers had evolved, becoming essential for businesses large and small across the U.S., with the National Cash Register Company, or NCR, leading the charge. They provided businesses with a way to track every transaction accurately and transparently. The register's ringing was synonymous with completed sales, giving customers and cashiers a clear signal that money had changed hands. However, the rise of electronic registers in the 60s, offering faster and more efficient processing, eventually led to the decline of the mechanical marvel. When discussing the 50s, one can never miss the famous roll films. Capturing home movies meant using roll film in the 50s, particularly the 8mm format. First introduced by Eastman Kodak in 1932, 8mm film made it possible for families to record their vacations, birthdays, and everyday moments in full motion. It gained massive popularity in the U.S. as more families could afford home movie cameras. Roll films were famous for being a huge leap forward from still photography, allowing families to live moments in motion for the first time. The portability and affordability of 8mm film cameras made them a household staple. However, the advent of camcorders and digital video cameras in the 80s and 90s made roll film obsolete, marking the end of an era for amateur filmmakers. Now. Let's move on to something more romantic in the 50s that people miss in modern times. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Don't let this... Drive-in theaters were a huge part of American culture in the 1950s, and paper drive-in theater speakers played a big role in the experience. First introduced in the 1940s, these speakers hung on car windows, allowing families to hear the film's audio while enjoying the movie from their cars. Drive-in theaters provided a personal audio experience, allowing each car to enjoy clear sound without blasting it across the entire lot. This made it a truly special experience. It was fun and intimate, perfect for date nights or family outings. But as FM radio sound systems became common in the 70s, these paper speakers faded into obscurity, leaving behind a trail of nostalgia for those who enjoyed drive-ins during their peak. Now the big question is, how did people cool off in their cars before air conditioning? 
It's go carb. That's funny. I had uh, about 4,000 hits. The answer is automobile window wing vents. Those small triangular windows and front doors became a crucial feature in cars in the 1930s through the 1950s. First introduced in the 30s, wing vents allowed drivers and passengers to regulate airflow, making drives more comfortable before air conditioning was common in vehicles. So, why were they a must-have? Well, wing vents provided a simple effective way to cool the car down without rolling down the entire window. Drivers could adjust the vents to redirect fresh air, helping them stay cool on hot summer days. However, as air conditioning became more widespread in cars during the 60s and 70s, wing vents became less necessary, and automakers eventually stopped including them in new models. Have you ever wondered how you would get to places before smartphones and GPS were invented? We have here a collection of three different uh, directories for the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We've got 1890, 1901. Street directory books were once popular for getting around town in the boomer era. First gaining popularity in the early 20th century, they were comprehensive guides that listed streets, addresses, and points of interest. In cities across the U.S., companies like Rand McNally produced these detailed directories, helping locals and visitors alike navigate urban environments. These books were the original Google Maps, offering people a reliable way to find addresses without asking for directions. They were especially useful for businesses, delivery drivers, and tourists. However, as GPS devices and smartphone maps emerged in the 90s and 2000s, street directories became outdated, leaving behind a nostalgic memory of flipping through pages to find your way. Who knew pencils could be more innovative than they are today? Still works fine after all these years, so nearly 100 years probably for this pencil. Uh, it's a very cool-looking clip. Mechanical pencils with replaceable lead made their mark in the mid-20th century. However, their origins date back to the 1820s, when Samson Morden and John Isaac Hawkins patented the first model. These pencils gained popularity in schools and offices across the U.S. during the 1950s because they eliminated the need for constant sharpening. What made them important was their durability and convenience. Users could extend the lead with a simple twist or click ensuring a continuous writing flow without interruptions. Mechanical pencils were essential for students, especially during exams or long note-taking sessions. However, as ballpoint pens gained ground, mechanical pencils began to lose their dominance in favor of smoother, more disposable options. What would you do in the 50s when you hosted a party and needed crushed ice? Enter the manual ice crusher. Mojitos, two frappe, Manual ice crushers first appeared in homes in the late 19th century and became a staple in the 1950s. Compact, hand-operated, and easy to store, these devices were particularly popular in the U.S., where home entertaining flourished post-World War II. They allowed families to make finely crushed ice for drinks or cold dishes in their kitchen. The appeal lay in their simplicity. With a turn of the crank, cubes could be turned into crushed ice ready for cocktails or summer parties. These crushers were indispensable in an era without refrigerators equipped with ice makers. However, as electric crushers and refrigerators with built-in ice machines became more widespread, manual ice crushers quickly became relics of the past. Imagine having your entire library of knowledge on a bookshelf. Let's talk about the then-famous encyclopedias. I always wondered where my mandibula was. Mm-hmm. To find out how you can own the new insect. We're studying the environment right now. Look at all this great stuff on ecosystems. Hardcover encyclopedias were a cornerstone of household education during the 1950s. Companies like Encyclopedia Britannica and World Book dominated the market, launching multi-volume sets in the 19th century, which grew in popularity across America in the mid-20th century. These encyclopedias provided comprehensive information on almost any subject, making them a must-have in homes and schools. I did a science report about how the universe began. You mean the Big Bang? Well, Oliver thinks it was actually a series of explosions caused by aliens from a parallel universe. Their in-depth articles, 
often written by experts, made them valuable and reliable sources of knowledge in an era before the internet. Owning a set was a status symbol, and for many students, it was an essential tool for homework and research. However, as online search engines and databases took over, hardcover encyclopedias quickly became outdated, taking a back seat to the digital age. So, what did computers have before the keyboards came into the picture? Now we'll dig into the key punch machines. Once the cards have been punched, the data is in a form that can be processed by machine. This system has a number of advantages over hand methods. Key punch machines developed in the early 20th century became crucial in the 1950s for entering data onto punch cards. These machines, notably produced by IBM, were popular in offices and government institutions where large amounts of data needed to be processed quickly. By the 1950s, they were widely used in the U.S. for everything from business record keeping to scientific research. Yet the amount continues to grow, and at a rate that makes it increasingly difficult to process, especially by hand methods. Key punch machines were known for their efficiency. They allowed operators to input data much faster than manual entry, streamlining processes in various industries. However, as computers with direct data entry interfaces became more sophisticated, key punch machines were replaced, becoming a thing of the past by the 1970s. Think of drawing technical plans by hand. Back then, that was the reality. The machinist must know how to read blueprints. They show him the shape of the machine part or other article he is to make, and its exact dimensions. Before the age of computer-aided design, manual drafting tools were essential for architects and engineers. Rulers, compasses, T-squares, and drafting boards, which gained prominence in the 18th century, remained the backbone of design work well into the 1950s. These tools were indispensable in drafting precise architectural and engineering plans across the U.S. and Europe. What made them so crucial was their precision. Professionals depended on these tools to create accurate, detailed drawings for construction, manufacturing, and design. The school drafting room will teach you to read blueprints, something you must know, especially if you want to become a designer. However, as CAD software became widespread in the late 20th century, manual drafting tools slowly faded into history, with most engineers now relying on digital technology to bring their ideas to life. Buying cigarettes from a vending machine on the street corner. Sounds weird. Well, back then it wasn't. Some vending companies can't even switch to the new dollar coin because the changeover won't pay for itself. But there's always adaptability in the North American business world. Cigarette vending machines first emerged in the early 20th century, with their popularity soaring in the 1950s. Found in public places like bars, restaurants, and gas stations across the U.S. and Europe, these machines allowed customers to purchase cigarettes with just a few coins. Major tobacco companies like Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds helped promote these machines as a convenient way to increase sales. What made them special was their accessibility. People could grab a pack without waiting in line or interacting with a cashier. However, as health concerns over smoking grew and age restrictions tightened, cigarette vending machines began to disappear by the 1990s. Today, They've mostly been replaced by regulated sales through retailers, making them a relic of a different time. Did you know canning was once a survival skill for most families? Get ready to find out more. But not content with merely looking the part, the proprietor here maintains the many traditional customs, like the cooking of jugged hair in this quaint old, believe it or not, pressure cooker. Pressure cookers, first invented by Dennis Papin in the 17th century, became a kitchen necessity in the U.S. by the 1950s, particularly for home canning. As post-war families focused on self-sufficiency and preserving food, pressure cookers provided a safe and efficient method for canning vegetables, fruits, and meats at home. These devices gained mass popularity thanks to brands like Presto. Pressure cookers gained popularity for their ability to cook and preserve food quickly, which was especially valuable in homes without refrigeration. Canning food for long-term storage helped families stay prepared, making it a must-have tool. However, as modern freezers and store-bought canned goods became more affordable, the pressure cooker for canning lost its place in the average kitchen. 
Are you curious to know about how the people of the 50s brewed their morning coffees? Percolators have three basic parts. A vessel for holding water to be heated. A vertical tube. Percolator coffee pots, first introduced in the late 19th century, were the go-to for brewing coffee at home by the 1950s. These stovetop or electric pots work by cycling boiling water through coffee grounds until the brew reached the desired strength. Popular brands like Farberware and West Bend dominated the market, and percolators were fixtures in American kitchens. What made percolators so beloved was their strong, rich flavor and the mesmerizing sound of water percolating. For many, the process was as much a morning ritual as the drink. However, the arrival of drip coffee makers in the 70s offered a cleaner, easier way to brew, leading to the decline of the percolator. One iconic thing about the 1950s was developing your photos in a room bathed in red light. Compared to the shadows, and the range of brightness values we get on the paper is compressed somewhat. And here is the resulting print. Before digital cameras, photography enthusiasts and professionals developed their films in home darkrooms. These darkrooms became popular in the 50s as film photography reached its golden age. With equipment like enlargers, chemical baths, and red safe lights, individuals could process and print their black and white photos at home, giving them full control over the final product. Home darkrooms allowed photographers a queer creativity. Photographers could adjust exposure, contrast, and other variables to create unique prints. However, the need for film in dark rooms dwindled as digital cameras and home printers entered the scene in the late 1990s. Today, only film enthusiasts and professional photographers maintain this art form. Do you know the joy of stacking multiple records for uninterrupted music? And a changer for standard 10 and 12 inch 78 RPM records for your present collection. Record changers, first introduced in the early 20th century, gained massive popularity in the 1950s. These devices allowed users to stack multiple vinyl records, automatically playing one after another. For music lovers, it was essential equipment for hosting parties or enjoying a full album experience without manually switching records. Third. 78 RPM, 10 and 12 inch record changer to play your present collection. Record changers were appealing because they offered the convenience of continuous play, no interruptions. Companies like RCA and Garrard perfected these machines, making them a must have for any serious music fan. However, as stereo systems and eventually CDs came onto the market, record changers fell out of favor, marking the end of an era for vinyl enthusiasts.